Hey, construction champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we're burning the house down twice a week, every Monday and every Thursday. I bring on amazing guests, just like today, just like every episode, and we talk about what it takes to be a construction champion. Lynn, it is great to have you here today. Thank you, Ron. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. I am as well. Our conversation prior, we just found out we we live very closely <laughs> to each other, and that's pretty amazing. Uh, so, Lynn, why don't you tell all the construction champions out there a little bit about yourself, what got you here to today, and what excites you? Sure. Uh, again, thanks for the opportunity, Ron. Looking, looking forward to this. A little bit of history about me. I started our firm way back 1989, we were focused on market research and strategic planning for generally medium-sized companies. Sometime in the late 1990s, uh, I did a couple of projects and started to realize that a lot of the clients I was working with had no clue. Well, I shouldn't say no clue. They had limited information about the customers that were leaving them. The customer turnover was sort of surprising. So in the early 2000s, we had another one of these kinds of projects, and it was with the Caterpillar dealer in South Carolina, Blanchard Machinery. And one thing led to another, so we started this ongoing feedback process. So we started with one Cat Caterpillar dealer. We now work with about 80% of the cat dealers in North America. Um, what they were interested in doing and still are is they want to get feedback from their customers, know how they make the customer experience far better than it is. Over the years, we've grown, thankfully. Uh, we now have a firm of about 100 people. We are based in Charlotte. Uh, that's where our headquarters are. We serve uh, companies throughout North America. We also have expanded beyond Caterpillar dealers, so it's a lot of material handling dealers now. Uh, some OEMs like Navistar and Agco, the makers of Fent and Massey Ferguson tractors, uh, and a variety of other companies. They're all industrial B2B kinds of companies who want to improve customer experience. Hmm. Awesome. I love it. We talk about customer experience on here all the time because it truly is a differentiator. So let's dive right in there. I'm going to ask sure. a million dollar question. And that is, what makes a construction champion? Hey, construction champions. It's your host, Ron Newsbaum here. And I want to talk to you about how you can automate all of your marketing. We've had so many people on here talk about getting the systems in place. Well, we have partnered with Build 12 and Construction Champions podcast. Les O'Hara, the founder what really excites me is his 30 years in the industry. And now he's built a system to be able to nurture your leads and continue to utilize that. I personally use the system myself. Build 12 is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of value in there. And it's a way to start getting away from Angie's list and all of that kind of stuff and start actually creating your own leads every day and have a system for them. So go on our website, check out the show notes, go check out Build 12 and what it can do for the front end of your business today. It's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend going and meeting with Les and his son, Devin, and talking to him about what they built for their own business. So the rest of the industry can take benefit from that. Here on Construction Champions, we're all about helping each other out. And what is better than contractors helping contractors? I say nothing. So let's go take this to the next level. Go check out Build 12. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Les or his son, Devin. We're here to help. We want to continue to grow the industry. I think what makes a construction champion is the leader who recognizes that the purpose of the business is to create uh, a customer who creates customers for them. So I love that. that. That's really 
one of the things I've been trying to get our, been talking about a lot with our clients and prospects is this is, uh, yes, it's about improving the customer experience, but we know that customers are that are happier will be more loyal. They'll spend more money with you. We also know, and this is some research we've done, we found out there's a lot of referral activity. Ag market, uh, construction market, power systems, generally 30 to 40% of the customers we talk to have said that we referred this provider to someone else in the last six, six months. However, it over 90% of those referrals come to come from those customers who are most satisfied with the customer experience they've had with this provider, be it an OEM, be it a product, be it a dealer, providing service, providing parts. You really do have to focus on that, you know, keeping those customers happy and getting them engaged with what you're doing. Well, yeah, there's there's no better customer than a customer that creates other customers. I love that because that, that's something we don't necessarily focus on. We focus on trying to create happy customers, but what what can we do to move the ball that makes that customer go talk about us to other people and come back and do more business with us? Yeah, I, th I think there, there are a couple of things. One, consistency. Um, and I'm speaking more in the context of maybe a Caterpillar dealer that's serving a construction company, but also it applies to construction companies. Uh, are they consistent in how they deal with the, the customer? Uh, so they, they've really got to, to pay attention to how they make that customer happy. Second thing is they've got to be the best communicators. We have looked at <laughs> one of the interesting things we've done is we found across all the markets we serve, communication is the biggest thing that drives customer satisfaction up or sends it into the, into the tank. Um, so you've got to be really, really good communicators. And that doesn't matter whether you're fixing a D6 or whether you're building a house. You know, I'll share from personal experience that we just built a house where we're living now. And the, the builder just did a fabulous job keeping us informed about what was going on. First time I'd ever built a house, didn't know what I was getting into. Fortunately, it turned out to be a really pleasant experience. And I've since recommended him to two other people. And I know that one of them has already signed him up for the building house where we live here. So... That's that communication is critical. That consistency in service delivery is critical. I I 100 percent agree. Being that I do communication for a living now these days, uh, that that it is the biggest driver of positive or negative. Like you have that in control. But you touched on something that I don't think we touch on enough, and that's that consistency piece. Because like it's one thing to like have a project that you do really really well and it went awesome and you create one customer that's a raving fan, but the other nine of them you did were horrible. And building that consistency into your business is what will pay long term dividends over and over again. It's not about just doing it right here and there, or it's not even about just doing it right. Like just hitting the right project with the right customer. It just came out perfect. It's recreating that for every customer you have. Yeah, and that's, that's something that if you think about it, um, if you're interacting with your provider, whatever that, whoever that provider is, whatever they're providing, um, they want to, if, if, if they have a good experience one time, they say, that's great. And the next experience is good. Great. Third experience, not so good. Fourth experience, maybe not so good. At some point, the customer starts to wonder, well, who am I dealing with? Am I dealing with the company ca that can deliver uh, consistently or, or not? And, you know, one of the things that, that I've learned over the years is the consistency matters because a lot of, if, if you're serving, say, a builder, with a, you know, providing service to their equipment, selling the equipment to them. Uh, they've got tight schedules. 
And so they want to be able to know that they can trust that someone's going to do the job on time, uh, within the budget, they whatever they agreed to, and 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 done correctly. Three very basic things, and you just have to do them all uh, consistently over time, which is extremely hard to do in large organizations. If you think about a construction equipment dealer, they have multiple locations typically. So you may have a great experience in one location, may have a less than great experience in another. So getting that consistency is, is, is critical. And I think this is one of the things that we provide to our clients is the, the, the senior management can see exactly how each location is doing. Each location can see the progress they're making or not making and, and the consistency of the service delivery. It, it really does matter. Yeah, it does. And I think you bring up a good point with multiple locations. And it's been one of the hardest things that I've tried, that I've been involved with. I've watched people try to scale. I've watched people do it well. I've seen people do it really well. But most people cannot figure out how to scale to multiple or not just areas, but buildings like having multi like multi-state or even within state just different uh having different operation centers or whatever we want to call offices in the construction industry and that's what you're talking about and i can see that parallel with where you're talking about the tractors and all the industrial or machinery and having to have that and that's something that guys we just haven't done good in the construction industry we really haven't figured out the best way to be able to move from one place to the next and continue to expand that way. Yeah, I think uh, the construction industry is a very interesting industry in that regard. Uh, it is an industry that is a lot of uh, process design is not as typically in a smaller construction company I do not see as much process management as there probably needs to be. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean we're trying to put everybody in a straitjacket. But let's face it, if you're a builder, no matter where you're building a big industrial building or you're building homes, um, a lot of that re relies on people who have learned over the years. And some of the things they've learned are great. Maybe some of the things they've learned are not. The point is that if, if you've got a, a building operation in Raleigh, you got one in Charlotte, and you've got one, say, in, on Emerald Isle, then you may have you may have three entirely different approaches to constructing the same thing, which may be may be appropriate, but sometimes uh, one, some things I've seen suggest that hey, they're they're really good things that that companies can learn from those are organizations or those places within their organizations that are doing things very well. It's a really big missed opportunity to try to learn from those locations, those divisions that are delivering either CX or whatever you might want to be talking about better than some of the others. Yeah. And it's, I think one of the big things is not just like how we do it. Like that's always a big thing that, that can vary in the construction industry, crew to crew. So have a project manager to project manager, especially when we're talking residential, uh, but also just having that clear process on this is how we do it. And then also having that cultural understanding of this is how we do it. Cause I think that's one of the hardest things when you're, when you're, Everybody wants to talk remote work and what that's like from a, a culture perspective and being able to keep people engaged. It, you start to have the same thing when you're working with different areas and different regions all under the same roof. Even if those people are showing up, you could have the, the three different offices you were talking about and all three of them have completely different cultures. <laughs> and that doesn't work. That's not sustainable. That, that's a really good point because... 
when I go out, I try to go out a, a lot and visit locations, not just the home office of a, one of our clients, but visit locations to see, get a feel for what's going on, what it's really like to, to deal with customers at a particular location. And what I find, Ron, is each location is, to, to your point, it's a different culture. They, it, and that culture is largely influenced by whoever is leading that location. Um, and that's probably, the culture thing is probably one of the toughest challenges. If you really want to ramp up your customer experience, you're going to have to deal with a whole lot of sort of culture questions that have been there for years and, you know, it's the old thing of we have always done it this way. Why do we change? Well, okay. If you if you're going to deliver good service, there may be some things that you're going to have to change, and that culture can uh, can get in get in the way, or the culture can speed it up. I love the quote from Peter Drucker, who said, uh, "Culture eats strategy for breakfast," and it's absolutely true. You can have the best laid plan. And it runs smack into the culture of the organization. And if it's not the right kind of culture, that plan will die of warning right there. I, I, I absolutely agree. And I was thinking while you were saying that, and you, you said, you know, the industry standard of this is just how we've always done it. Like, that's just, <laughs> that, but it, like this is how we've always done, but everything changes around us. But for some reason, we always go back to like this is everything has changed, but this is how we've always done it. So we're going to keep it the same. To me, that is not a usable objection. I mean, that's one that if if you're using that, and I I've said it on here multiple times. Like if you're using that, that is what needs fixed in your business. Like if your immediate thing is that's just how we've always done it, like you need to go look in the mirror, reevaluate whatever that is and fix it because it's broken. Yes. Yes. Uh, for sure. It, it, that can certainly be the case. So when you're out and you're going to all these different places and you're, you're seeing different cultures and you're seeing changes. What, what do you think are the, like the top couple of things that change from the main, the main headquarters to these other places? What's the hardest thing to transfer to a satellite location or out to the field or to remote workers? What, what's that? What's a couple of things like that just seem to always go away? One of the one of the things I think is probably hardest to to uh, and this is an interesting question, but probably the hardest. Yeah, it, it really is an interesting question. Uh, is is uh, empathy? Um, because to think about it. Let's say the people in the home office are looking at it and say, "Okay, uh, we want to do this. We want to do that. We're measuring." profitability, of course, in sales. So the first thing they tend to talk about with local people is, well, sales and profitability. Well, sometimes you might need to talk about, let's, let's spend the first 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of this review talking about your employee situation. Not the necessarily who's left and who's coming in is new, although that could be part of it, but just give me a feel as a as a senior leader about how you how you assess your organization's culture at this location. And our because if, if the culture is not right there, then you can't. It's very hard to make that culture change. It's very hard to create that empathy. Because to, uh, to be honest with you, Ron, this does, when I say empathy, empathy for the customer, empathy for another employee you're working with to get something done, you really, to quote Fred Reichel, the developer of Net Promoter Score system, I should say, um, it's about loving your customer. And that doesn't mean you roll over and do everything the customer wants, but you generally have some empathy for that customer. So, for example, if it's the builder that's building a, a building here in Wilmington, 
um, you understand that even though you got some challenges sometimes as you go through the process, particularly if it's a big industrial building, you still got to be concerned about that customer, the budget, the quality you're delivering, and keeping that customer informed. And, and going back to this communication thing, to me, good communication is a sign of empathy. It's a sign of care. Uh, it's a sign that you want to let that customer know where you are because that reduces the customer's blood pressure. It reduces the customer's anxiety about whatever they're doing. You know, just imagine if you've got a, a D8 that's down and you, you, you don't keep a lot of spare D8s around to do a road construction project. You've got a tight deadline and all of a sudden you've got to have some work done on it. You know, so there needs to be some understanding from the, the, the client, or, or I should say our, our providers, that you at least got to listen to the customer. You may have to tell him something that he or she does not like. Sir, I'm sorry, but there's just no way we have the capacity to get it done in the time frame. And then the other thing about being empathetic is give the customer some options. So, for example, maybe that thing needs repair and it's going to be two weeks uh, later. Can you offer a rental? Can you provide something to him? It may not be exactly what he wants or needs, but at least it will allow the customer to get the project moving. So it goes back to being empathetic. You, you absolutely have to have genuine concern for that customer and how you want to interact with that customer. Hmm. I love that because I think when we think of empathy, empathy, if I can say that, <laughs> well, when we think about that, we, that's, we don't necessarily think about it as just doing right by the customer and like you said give them options let them know where you're at and just be real like it's not necessarily having to feel what they feel but just understanding they are going to feel what they feel because of whatever you do and how you present it and how you yes. position it and i think that's a that's a great a great overview on how to look at that differently than what we standardized kind of look at it. And I think it can kind of get played out. It's a hot item. It's a hot topic that people talk about, but how you just broke it down to me, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I, I just, it's one of those things that run that's just so hard uh, to ingrain in organization. And I think I'm, as I, as I see things, changing you know we have newer uh, younger people coming into a lot of these organizations um i honestly think i'm seeing a little more empathy creep in than what i've seen in the past hmm. um I, I really and i can i'm thinking about several of our clients that, that, you know caterpillar dealers for example uh these are all family-owned businesses and and they have Caterpillar requires that there be a family member for succeeding generations. And um, some been some newer, younger people come into leadership roles in these dealerships, and they're really shaking some things up in the right way. <laughs> I, I, I like I like what I I like what I see in many of these younger leaders that are coming into the organizations. Awesome. I love that. What what are you seeing that is impressing you here and making you feel that? I think um they're the ones I'm the ones in my mind I'm thinking about, they really are, are very willing to address culture. And what that means is they have high expectations for the company. And so they are really going after how do we change the culture? Hmm. In some cases, this means a lot more development spending than a person, personal development spending for some of their key employees. In some cases, uh, honestly, they're the people who get replaced because culturally they're just not a good fit for the kind of culture that uh, they're trying they're trying to build. And I think. Sometimes uh, we call 
we fall, we become guilty about just accepting people. Well, you know, John is a great service tech or John is good at this or that or the other, but John is cranky as hell. John is, uh, uh, you know, John has, John has difficulty dealing with other people in the company. Well, at some point, if you're going to change the culture, you got to change John in, in some cases, if it's a small location. So you've got to really try to address that. And a lot of them are really saying, hey, we, we, we've got to change our approach to people. And I think that may be the biggest thing I'm seeing with this next generation of people coming in, they they really do embrace, they they really do embrace this notion that people uh, people can be very much the part of the solution uh, to to changing and improving the business. And I can think of several right now where it's really refreshing to see how they're changing the organization in a very positive way. It's not a We'll kick you out of here if you don't if you don't change. It's a very positive construction, a constructive uh, change process. That's awesome. I love to hear that because I, I I think we don't hear that enough these days. When you have younger leaders coming in, we're not. It's not necessarily. You don't hear about all the positives that are happening, uh, more about the negatives, because a lot of this is just how we've always done it comes up when new, yes. When, yes. The new when the new thought process yes. to roll in. <laughs> we've always done it that way, so why should we change? And, mm -hmm. and um, that is something in this day and age with all the, you know, take for example, a lot of the equipment that we, or the, OEMs and dealers we work with, that equipment is changing dramatically and there's a lot more competition. So you've got to think about some ways to differentiate yourself. And I think customer experience is one of the best ways, uh, along with having a great product. Uh, but again, there are a lot of great products out there in most any market you want to look at. So having that customer experience, which is very, very hard to compete against if you're competing against someone that uh, that delivers a great job. Awesome, man. Well, great conversation today. I, I have absolutely loved having you on the show. Uh, for all the construction champions out there, if they wanted to connect with you, learn more about what you do, where's the best place for them to do that? Um, best place is our website, thedanielgroup.com or just send me an email at lindaniel at thedanielgroup.com. I'll be glad to respond, chat with you, how, whatever you'd like to do. More than happy to do that. Awesome, Lynn. Well, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Ron, thanks a lot. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Awesome. All right, Construction Champions, another episode in the Bay where we really dove into culture processes what does this look like how do we deliver a customer experience across the board consistently on every job on every interaction we have whether it's with a customer or with an employee because if you're running a business your employees are just as much your customers as your customers are and you start to create what kind of environment those interactions happen in. And if you don't have consistency with that, do you think your company and your employees are going to have consistency with their customers? This is all stuff we have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves. Because at the end of the day, to be a construction champion, you have to be the one that's leading the business, that's out there at the forefront and willing to ask yourself these questions. Take the hard look in the mirror and start to understand Am I the one that's creating the right or am I the one that's creating the wrong? Because you're doing one of the two in your business every day. I think Lynn had some powerful stuff that he shared here today. I absolutely loved it. Make sure you go out, you check out all of our sponsors. And until next time, be the champion that you were meant to be. Introducing Buildercom's, your comprehensive construction communication software. 
Simplify project management with Unify Communications, real-time picture and document sharing, and instant project notifications. Keep everyone in the loop and ensure client satisfaction. Experience the transformation in construction project management with Buildercoms. Start streamlining your projects and keeping clients ecstatic today. Say goodbye to misunderstandings and endless email digging. Say hello to more winning time. Choose Buildercoms, your gateway to construction project success.